Again, I'm Karen Smith Fernandez, the Director of Major Gifts here at Nature Serve, and I wanted to introduce our presenters today, Allison Gratz, who is the Director of Network Relations here at Nature Serve. Uh, Bryce Maxell, who's the program coordinator at the Montana Natural Heritage Program, as well, well as the chairman of the Nature Serve Board, and uh, John Odding, the chief of conservation planning services for the Florida Natural Areas Inventory. And as you all know, uh, today we will be talking about the Nature Serve Network and the power of this network. So, Allison, let me turn it over to you. Great. Uh, thanks, Karen. Um, I'm really happy to be here today. Thanks everyone for uh, joining uh, this webinar about the Nature Serve Network. Um, today we'll be uh, talking about what is the Nature Serve Network and how does the network and, and Nature Serve work together to achieve our common mission of uh, biodiversity conservation and stewardship. Um, <clears throat> so many of you may have seen um, these slides on previous webinars, but just to uh, set the stage. Um, NatureServe uh, went through a strategic planning process not too long ago where we um, reestablished our vision um, and mission um, to, um, to solidify ourselves and our, our strategic objectives for the next few years. Um, we also um, in established some values uh, for ourselves as an organization <clears throat> to uh, reinforce um, how we operate and uh, how we work as an organization, um, both within and uh, with the network. Um, so we are a leading conservation science NGO. We have about 60 staff uh, located um, in North America um, and one in Latin America. Um, and uh, we leverage our staff uh, within NatureServe with over a thousand conservation professionals across the network, which we'll talk about um, in more detail. Um, so let's talk about the, the network um, and why it's unique and uh, something for all of us to be really proud of. Um, so way back um, in 1970, uh, we had the establishment of the first Earth Day. Um, and along after that came um, some, some landmark legislation such as the uh, Clean Water Act and uh, the Endangered Species Act um, in the US. And uh, starting in 1974, we established our first uh, natural heritage program um, in South Carolina. Um, and going across then over the next 15 years, uh, we established a, uh, a network program in uh, every state in the US and in the provinces in Canada as well. Um, and we also have two um, other network programs, Navajo Nation and uh, the Tennessee Valley Association. So um, these local programs really came out of the grassroots efforts of those uh, conservation milestones um, in the 70s and 80s. And so here we are today. Um, we have a, uh, a uh, network program. Um, we use that term to, to loosely uh, um, refer to all of our network programs. So all of the programs in the United States and in Canada. In Canada, they're called conservation data centers. In the US, you may hear natural heritage program. You may hear um, uh, natural heritage inventory and um, other program names, um, but they are all uh, network programs, regardless uh, if they have some different nomenclature. Um, and overall, in North America, these make up over a thousand uh, scientists as, as program staff. Um, we have uh, about 65 programs, and uh, we're in the, in the US and Canada. Um, and so what really makes us a network? Um, we, we, you know, you look at the map of North America, there's programs, they're, they're, they can all be different, but we have a common, we have a common core. Um, and those are common stan standards and methods. So when um, a program in Nevada is on the phone, uh, when Kristen's staff out there is out there collecting data, they're out there collecting data in the same standard that they're doing in Maine or that they're doing in British Columbia. And so we have these common, these common uh, standards and methods that we all operate by, which makes us, makes everything that we do um, inherently late. Um, we have this ability um, 
to have these local experts on the ground and then scale up from that. So we can go from the very small area of a small state or a province and scale that up to the nation and scale that up to the North American content, con continent and, and further. Um, we share data and innovations across, of, across our network, which we'll hear about in a little bit. Um, so we're, we, we, we are this collaboration hub uh, for the network programs to learn from each other. Um, and we have a shared history, uh, which we heard about. Uh, so we come out of these, um, these large legislations and these efforts to um, nationally and globally uh, preserve conservation. And we share a common goal and purpose. Our mission is the conservation of biodiversity through the use of science and to influence data, influence decision making of land managers and conservationists through data and specifically data from our network programs. Um, and so our goal as NatureServe as part of as part of our network is to make sure that data from our network programs is integrated into decision making processes to improve conservation outcomes and um, as part of that we um, we strive to deliver data to um, data users efficiently and effectively um, we we want to maintain our rep reputation of having the best available data for conservation decision making um, provide uh, sustained and reliable support for our network programs and improve our data quality, currency, and completeness over time. Um, and so, so specifically, our network programs are the local experts um, in their in their context, um, and they they work to uh, promote and, and use our standard methodologies to manage the high quality biodiversity information that they are collecting uh, you know, at the local level. Um, they, they support the objectives of the NatureServe network, um, including the goal of data sharing. So we have this um, network of programs that are collecting data in the same method, they're managing data and they're sharing data with each other and with NatureServe. And therefore all of that comes together, um, supporting the role of using science to inform conservation action. Um, so at the local level, our network programs are out there doing surveys and collecting data. They're maintaining that data, um, making sure it's in a high quality format they are um, looking at species that are of interest to them, at-risk species and ecosystems at the local level and maintaining those ranks and sharing them with NatureServe. And, um, and they also provide additional um, expertise and resources for people who come to NatureServe for, for data support. Um, so at a glance, our network um, is made up of, as we said, um, over uh, 50 or over 60 uh, programs in, the, in North America, and they vary widely in um, their uh, demographics and how they operate. Um, we have some very small programs and we have some very large and well-resourced programs. Um, and a whole bunch uh, in the middle as well. Um, so budgets um, are often a reflection of how many staff they have. So in these very small programs, they may only have one or two full-time staff people. In the, larger, in the larger programs, they'll have many staff, they'll have uh, many departments and be, and be very well resourced. resourced. It, it varies widely across the network. Um, and we also um, have a bit of variation in where these programs are situated. Many of them were created, like I said, along with the Endangered Species Act. And so they sit within a state agency that is linked to, to that, such as the Fish and Wildlife Service or Fish and Game. Um, so they'll be seated in a, in a state agency, but there are, but there are many that are not, um, and they may be in an academic institution, they may be in a museum or a library, and we even have one in Canada that's actually its own nonprofit organization. 
So again, their local context um, will vary and that will um, also influence, you know, how they interact with NatureServe and, and the network. Um, so, so where is NatureServe in all of this? Um, so NatureServe, we like to think of ourselves as the hub uh, for all of these different network programs. Um, we are the place where the network programs come uh, to collaborate with each other and to um, in, you work together to improve things. Um, it's our job to maintain these common data standards. So the, the, the basic standards and methods of how all of the programs operate out there um, in the field. Um, we maintain the, the naming, the taxonomy for um, all of the all of the data that we're collecting. So all the species names, the ecosystems names to make sure they're all consistently applied across the network so that we can combine our data and we can share our data and it, it's all uh, able to be uh, combined um, across North America. Um, we maintain actual uh, software and tools uh, that our network programs use in their data collection and their management and sharing their data with us. Um, we support that data exchange uh, between ourselves and network programs. Um, we maintain the global ranks. So our, our state and provincial programs uh, maintain the, um, <clears throat> maintain the uh, uh, sub, subnational uh, ranking, so the ranking in their jurisdiction, um, and then we maintain the global ranking. Um, we also are a central data repository. We maintain a database where we're constantly exchanging and updating data from local programs um, in a centralized in a centralized data. Uh, so we basically are the, the spoke, as I said, the hub in that wheel that allows everything from the network to come into one and be and be uh, looked at as as one data set. Um, and um, then even further than that, uh, we strive to really um, work with our network to collaborate with the network to um, uh, do things regional or national or network wide to improve all of our efforts for biodiversity conservation. Um, and we may, we have this um, graphic here that talks about our data to decisions life cycle, which is sort of, you know, everything that we can do with the data and how we amass the data and manage it in order to ultimately lead to conservation decisions. Um, in this um, graphic, what I'd like to point out is um, in this collect uh, box, which is the fundamental starting point of all of this, this is this is where our network programs really shine. They're the ones out there for the most part, collecting data, surveying, finding new populations, checking to make sure that populations that we knew were there are still there, um, yeah, and collecting all this data, maintaining it, and then sharing it with NatureServe. And what we are able to do um, with with the data from the network is we are able to um, maybe combine that with, with other data sets. Uh, we can use that to um, make do analyses, uh, you know, on species status, the rankings, all, you know, all of that. And we'll hear about some of these efforts that we can do uh, when we work together um, in a minute. Um, and then, you know, we can push that knowledge out so that people are aware of what's going on. Um, you may have seen our biodiversity in focus uh, report that came out not too long ago. That is um, a uh, really good example of the kind of communications we can do with the data that um, starts with our network programs. Um, and then, uh, and then, you know, uh, our ultimate goal here is to have our data used to make good conservation decisions. Um, and behind all of that are all of these um, technology solutions that we have implemented that allows us to work with the network in order to be able to do those things. So we have um, surveys that um, for, the, for our network programs to collect more data. We have a interface called Biotics where um, 
we access data from the network and the network accesses our data and where we share all of that. Um, we have tools to, to um, look at data and look at data products and make sure they're accurate and let the network professionals uh, review work that we have done to uh, make sure it's credible and accurate. Um, we have our Nature Serve Explorer and other tools where we communicate um, the data to the public. So everything on here, these, um, these, uh, all of these data that you can see on NatureServe Explorer comes from our network programs. And then in the end, we have these, uh, you know, data products and data tools um, that allow decision making. Um, and one of the one of the tools there that we'll just highlight for a moment is our environmental review tool. Um, which is a tool that we've created that allows network programs who are um, involved in environmental review for, say, permitting processes and things like that, um, to streamline their processes where the, um, the person who needs the environmental review can um, go in and uh, look at the area that they're looking at and access the program's database and, um, you know, get a, get a get some information on that about how they need to go about um, doing that. And so this is just a tool that NatureServe has created for our network programs to be able to help them meet their missions um, at the local level. Um, and I think with that, I will hand it over to Bryce to provide us uh, an example of uh, collaboration between uh, NatureServe and the network. Thanks, Allison. And I'll just tell you to advance the slides if that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> when ready. Um, my name is Bryce Maxwell. I'm the program coordinator at the Montana Natural Heritage Program. And uh, we are housed in the Montana State Library, which is that was that little yellow portion of the pie chart that Allison showed. Very unique, but I also think very valuable to have our program in the state library in terms of being in a neutral and non-regulatory environment where we're we're just bringing information uh, together for everyone to have a common uh, source of information for everyone to use. So next slide, please. I wanted to give you a feel for the information resources that we manage. Um, and looking at the triangle in the upper right there, we're trying to address these main questions. What is it? Where is it? And how is it doing? And to do that, we uh, assimilate, uh, assemble all of the information that you see in the big uh, pyramid there starting at the bottom there, taxonomy and element information, what species, what habitats do we have, structured surveys, where have people looked for certain species uh, with uh, standard protocols, observations. I should say that before I go too much higher on this, that the numbers out to the right are uh, indi indicate what we have assembled um, and how much that's changed over the last year or so. Um, Observations or where uh, are the precise point locations where uh, species have been observed. Species of concern occurrences, uh, which are element occurrences in, across the network, um, are local populations of species of concern that we want to make sure we highlight for uh, resource agencies. Um, models, uh, we need to fill in large gaps. We have a lot of private land in Montana. And the models allow us to do that in places where we don't have surveys. We do that for individual species. And we also stack those models up to look at overall predicted biodiversity, or in the case of invasive species, cumulative invasion risk. Uh, range polygons, we try to have those in place for in all individual species, and then global and subnational ranks. We do all of that to bring information together um, quickly and allow people to make good decisions quickly and informed decisions. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> just want to give you a sense on how we're doing um, in that effort. Uh, this is for our botanical side of things. And you can see here that uh, we have uh, good representation for um, our vascular plants, our lichens, our diatoms, um, even fungi. Uh, we've recently added a, a, a complete taxonomic list for fungi in the state. Um, we are almost there uh, in terms of having complete taxonomic representation. We're a little weak on hornworts, cyanobacteria, and algae, but, but we are almost there. So 7,000, almost 500 species. Next slide, please. Um, 
On the animal side, we have a long way to go. Uh, we're at um, 8,000 ish species right now. I think we'll probably be end up being around 15,000 species uh, that we'll have in our databases here. Notably, we are weak on the um, invertebrate taxa um, and specifically the, the arthropods and insects where we're, we have a long way to go and where we really depend on our network interaction there. Um, and we really depend on NatureServe for providing that uh, taxonomy um, and for other programs like Canadian programs that are adding a bunch of species to their databases that also benefits our program. So being part of the network and, and um, linked to nature are very important for us in accomplishing our, our mission. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this is just showing you some of the spatial data we manage, uh, four and a half million observations. We're almost at 16,000 species, um, almost at half a million surveys. Uh, 81,000 of those local populations of uh, species of concern that we have mapped that, uh, again, can be put on the radar screen of natural resource managers when they're making their decisions. Uh, we have around, uh, well, actually, we have over 1,100 species modeled at this point and um, 2,800 species with range polygons. Um, I want to say for all of these, uh, we rely on nature serve standards that are created so that we're following a network standard. Next slide, please. Um, we then stack up our individual predicted habitat suitability models for individual species. And this is an example of overall habitat suitability, uh, predicted habitat suitability for um, all of our native vertebrate species. So higher predicted biodiversity or suitability for habitat for biodiversity shown in the yellow colors there and lower um, habitat suited, cumulative habitat suitability for biodiversity in the blue colors there. This has uh, been a recent product that we've put out um, and making sure all of our partners have access to it for landscape level planning efforts. Um, all of our land trusts, uh, but also for like forest plan revisions and BLM uh, resource management plan updates. Uh, this is a key product for all of those big landscape level planning efforts. Uh, also, local governments are using that for their um, county planning efforts. Next slide, please. Um, this one is showing cumulative risk of invasion uh, by our state listed noxious weeds, our 41 state listed noxious weeds. And um, again, highest cumulative risk of invasion in yellow and lowest cumulative risk of invasion by these 41 species in blue. Um, and before I go any further, I want to make sure that we're saying uh, we got major uh, inspiration from NatureServe and their Moby product um, in developing these, um, these landscape level planning tools. Next slide, please. <clears throat> um, on the habitat side of things, we manage the statewide land cover layer, and we're also mapping all of the wetlands in the state because wetlands are so important to biodiversity using the National Wetland Inventory Standards. Next slide. Global uh, conservation status ranks. Um, I think many of you are familiar with the, the both the G and the S ranking system, um, critically imperiled at the uh, global or subnational scale at G1, S1, and secure at the global or subnational scale at the G5, S5. And the upper right image shows you global ranks for US animals and the high level of imperilment for some of those groups like freshwater snails and terrestrial snails, freshwater mussels, a lot of red there, way too much red there. Below that are state ranks uh, in the bottom right of this image for our Montana animals, showing you that uh, we're very fortunate in Montana uh, to have low levels of imperilment. Um, next slide, please. And then global conservation status of uh, 11,356 native species in Montana. Um, again, what I wanna show you here is our low levels of imperilment. We're very fortunate in Montana, but I also wanna show you these big gray bars that we would get nowhere with without NatureServe and without other network programs and collaborating them with them. Uh, we don't have global ranks on our fungi. Uh, we have huge numbers of invertebrates that we do not have global ranks on. Um, and some of our non-vascular plants that we need to uh, have 
uh, global ranks assigned. And, and the same picture is uh, similar for uh, our subnational ranks. We have a lot of work left to do, um, and it's a very important uh, portion of our jobs and something that we depend greatly on NatureServe to and other programs to assist us with. Next slide. Um, this is a map showing um, global ranks of vegetation communities across the country. And just to highlight Montana, we are moving and um, dependent on Nature Serves Ecology program for this, moving our land cover layer to the National Vegetation Classification System. And this is going to be really valuable for us in highlighting in eastern Montana these um, grasslands that are uh, 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 globally uh, imperiled, at least at the G3 level. Um, and that is going to allow us to highlight that to our uh, partners to a much greater extent. But we just cannot do this without uh, both the network and the lead ecologist at NatureServe. Next slide, please. Um, just want to briefly talk about how we deliver data to our um, uh, stakeholders. We have about 1,300 natural resource managers in Montana that have an agency level access to our environmental uh, summary tools. And um, they can get in and look at each of these data products that I've just taken you through um, in a live web application. And uh, I'll take you through some highlights of that. But every single environmental review process that is done in Montana makes use of this information and resource managers can get in there and in just a couple minutes see what they need to see either at a large scale or a, a fine scale for individual species or uh, biological communities. Next slide please. This is our standard environmental summary report that we put together for and uh, you can see some topical areas covered in the table of contents there. Um, that again, within, and I've timed myself on this, about two minutes, you can generate an environmental summary report that could be plugged into any um, National Environmental Policy Act process or Montana Environmental Policy Act process. And that summarizes everything about the species and habitats um, that is in a local area like this watershed that you see on the, on the front uh, picture of this environmental summary report. Next slide, please. Within the web application, they can also see information on uh, individual species. So here we're seeing uh, a particular plant species where all of those gray dots are survey locations, veg vegetation plot survey locations where a species could have been detected. Um, and then you're also seeing modeled output. Uh, the yellow is low suitability, the orange is moderate suitability, and the red is optimal suitability habitat for this species. Next slide, please. We also break down for our, our uh, resource managers that are using this, what is their sort of um, obligation on the landscape. So in this upper portion of this image, we have black-tailed prairie dog, and we see that for this particular watershed we're looking at, 8% of that watershed is optimally suitable habitat for the species, 45% is moderately suitable habitat, and then in the yellow there, 46% is low suitability. Below that, these pie charts then tell us what are the uh, ownership um, of, of the lands that are optimal, moderate, or low suitability. So we see on the left pie chart there that BLM has 1,034 acres that is optimal suitable habitat, about 11% of that watershed um, that they're responsible for. In the middle pie chart, we see that we also have state uh, lands that are that provide moderately suitable habitat, about 10% of, of that watershed. So we're trying to bring that forward to resource managers. Next slide, please. Um, and then finally, we bring all this together. You can go ahead and click through this a bit. Um, we're providing um, field guides, companion field guides. So as we're providing these lists of species, we're providing information on the biology and status and habitat use of individual species with companion field guides to our environmental summary report. Next slide. Thank you. Great. John, I'll turn it over to you. Just let me know when to advance. Okay, thanks everyone. Hi, my name is John Odding. I'm the 
Chief of Conservation Planning Services at the Florida Natural Areas Inventory. So we are Florida's uh, Heritage Program and member of the NatureServe Network. And um, you know, Allison and Bryce have already done a great job of kind of outlining, giving you an overview of NatureServe role in the network, NatureServe Central, and then a typical uh, or, or a, a local heritage program's functions and role. So I will just add a couple of <clears throat> examples of ways that we have uh, directly collaborated with NatureServe on some projects and, and just a few other thoughts from a uh, Florida perspective. So next slide. So one of the major projects we work directly with NatureServe staff on is, is with species habitat modeling. Uh, Bryce mentioned they've done a lot of this also in, um, in Montana. Uh, so we've collaborated with NatureServe on about 30 species habitat models over the past five to six years. Now, that, uh, our program and NatureServe both kind of have the technical capacity to do species habitat modeling on our own, and we both do a lot of that as well. But this collaboration on some of these projects uh, is particularly valuable, I think, for these reasons. Uh, in this case, you know, we're able to supply uh, the, uh, the species occurrence data for the local uh, species locations, and we are able to review those with a lot of local data to make sure that um, they're the best, you know, most accurate representation they can be. Uh, we also can provide local um, specialized environmental data. So whereas Nata, NatureServe has a, a large nationwide environmental data library, um, we're able to bring some additional layers to bear that are unique to Florida or the Southeast. Um, and then, of course, NatureServe has developed and, and maintains a very sophisticated modeling platform that includes that environmental predictive data library I mentioned as well as a series of model review tools so that it makes it really easy for us to work with species experts to review data and models. And then, uh, of course, the results are made available by NatureServe to share across the network uh, for additional uses. Next slide. Um, so here's just kind of a schematic of how this works. Um, you know, the, the local product, the, lo the local program such as us provides the occurrence data, number one. Uh, Nature Service providing most of the environmental predictor layers, number two. Um, Nature Service kind of provides the, the modeling engine, so to speak, to develop those models with, and then has the tools to, to facilitate expert review of those models. And then we're able to bring in and you know bring along some of those species experts that have the local knowledge that can use the NatureServe review tools to you know, provide feedback and input on the models to improve them. Next slide. And this is just another way of kind of showing that same process, um, the, showing the role that the local program can bring to the process as well as the role NatureServe brings. Uh, next slide. So another major project we've done with NatureServe is to assist them with element ranking. Um, both Allison and Bryce mentioned the value of element uh, global and subnational uh, rarity or heritage ranks. Um, and in this case, you know, NatureServe does a lot of the global ranking, but they, you know, there's there's a lot of species out there and more than they necessarily have capacity for. So they're able to rely on local programs to assist with some of this work, and they have worked with us to do uh, species status assessments and, and global ranking for about 55 species over the past two years. Um, again, it's a great symbiosis where NatureServe is bringing the power of that standardized biotics database and, the, and a consistent methodology. And we're bringing the local species expertise from our staff and, you know, and an additional staff capacity to do this work. And, um, we're able to collaborate on the ranking process. And then again, those results are available to share out across the network. The network. <clears throat> and there's, an, there's additional work going on across the network right now uh, to collaborate on reviewing state or subnational ranks just to make sure they're kind of more consistent across borders. So if you see a rarity rank from Florida and one from Georgia, you know, the, the two make sense and are, are fairly consistent. So there's a lot of work going on right now along those lines. Next slide. Um, 
So just in general, I wanted to mention a couple of the values of, uh, you know, the network process. You know, you if, if you remember back to your your high school civics class, you probably remember hearing about one of the real strengths of the United States governmental system is having these 50 states with relative autonomy. And you may remember the phrase, you know, um, laboratories of democracy, where different states have the ability to experiment with different policies and programs and things that work really well can spread across the states and around the country. And I think that's a great metaphor for one of the strengths of the NatureServe network. You know, our programs have a lot of individual autonomy. We are self-administered. We're housed within different agencies in each state or, or Canadian province. Um, so we have a lot of autonomy, but we all subscribe to a common methodology and set of standards that NatureServe coordinates. Um, and, you know, a lot of us kind of can do some innovative work and come up with some new ideas. And if it really is, it works well and makes sense for other programs, it can quickly spread throughout the network through, you know, NatureServe communication channels. And I think that's a real strength of the program. Another strength I wanted to mention is, you know, I don't want to, I think you can't underestimate the power of me in Florida and Bryce in Montana getting together and being able to talk the same language about element occurrences and global heritage ranks and species habitat modeling and be able to speak that common language and currency. There, I just don't know of any other places out there, whether it's NGOs or other state agencies or other opportunities where you could get someone from these two different parts of the country and have them be on the same page immediately when, when dealing with these issues. And that is really a strength of this network and it's something that NatureServe makes possible through all of the coordination and communication that they nurture, you know, the conferences, the Zoom calls. I mean, we, it's it's just a real tremendous strength that we have that immediate common currency and common language. So I just wanted to share those thoughts. Um, I think that's it for me. I don't know if you had any other slides of mine. Um, so I think I'll turn it back to you, Allison. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Bryce. Thanks, John. Um, uh, so I think that's it for our slides. Um, and uh, you, oh, you want to take it over, Karen? I was just going to say that um, maybe we could take it over to the Q&A and um, Misty uh, Nelson, our Associate Director for Network Relations, is going to facilitate those questions. This can also just be a uh, discussion if uh, if there are no specific questions, but why don't we start uh, with some questions, Allison, unless you had any final words, and uh, Misty, uh, take on. Oh, sure. I'll, I'll, yeah. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, please feel free to ask any questions, put them in the chat or the Q&A. Um, and I will read them out and see if we can get the panelists to answer. Um, there's one here that I really like. Um, can someone speak to preparations that are occurring either network-wide or um, in different regions um, related to nature serving the network and upcoming 2025 revisions of state wildlife action plans. That may be good for Bryce or John. I'm also happy to talk about the few things that I know about too. I can, I can start anyway. Um, so our uh, in Montana State Wildlife Action Plan is on a 2025 uh, schedule uh, for updating, and essentially our Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks is is using most of the information that will go into the State Wildlife Action Plan update is uh, information from our databases, and um, again, totally, totally depending on our conservation status ranks that we're assigning to individual species and uh, at the subnational level in Montana, as well as the global conservation status ranks that NatureServe is assigning. Um, some good news for Montana uh, for this swap update is that we are going to see addition of our uh, plant conservation strategy that we've uh, we're been working on over the last few years. So there will be uh, inclusion of plants in some form or another. 
Uh, they're cautious about how they're doing that. The Fish, Fish Wildlife and Parks is. Um, and they're also going to include some representation for various invertebrate groups. Um, and that will, if something like RAWA, Recovering America's Wildlife Act, passes, that will allow Montana uh, uh, organizations to apply for those funds um, that are, would be available under RAWA for addressing issues with invertebrates and with, um, with plants. So we're super excited to do that. Um, and then the last thing I want to say, at least for Montana, is that uh, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks um, couldn't find uh, tech people within their own agency that wanted to tackle this. So we are developing a dashboard for their for their swap um, in terms of um, what action, individual actions they're doing for individual species and how that impacts individual species. And it kind of fits right in with our other data products. So we're very happy to do that for them. Great, thanks. Um, John, anything to add um, as a program? Yeah, I'll just uh, add, um... I, I'm not sure what our um, update schedule is in Florida, but we do. We work very closely with Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, who are in charge of our state wildlife action plan. And we actually have a contract with them to evaluate their species of greatest conservation need list, which I think is required of all the states. Um, we've been assessing a, a long list of species that potentially should be added or removed to that list for Florida. So. Um, so yeah, we have a good relationship with them and are plugged into that process. Great, thanks. Yeah, and I can just touch on another project um, that just recently uh, got wrapped up in the Southeast US in partnership with the Atlanta Botanic Garden to develop a regional plant list of species of greatest conservation need. Um, and I know a couple of folks on the call were involved um, in that project as well. Um, it involved just a lot of regional collaboration through a whole bunch of states, um, updating global ranks where needed, but that um, those ranks are really, can be a real driving force in determining what species end up on the um, species of greatest conservation need lists across the board. And I know at the national level, um, there's a push for states to try and be more consistent in how they're assigning their SGCNs. And um, there's a lot of effort to get those ranks, both from NatureServe at the global level and then at, from the heritage programs um, involved in places where they may not necessarily be um, directly translating into the SGCNs. So that's, that's something that our data and our expertise really inform. Um, See, got a couple of questions in the chat and a couple in the Q and A. Misty, uh, I can take that question from Rush Holt. Uh, okay, great. Um, basically, uh, Rush, in terms of how we would address legislators, uh, is that we're a program that the information that we provide allows all kinds of economic processes to move forward. Whether you're a timber company harvesting timber and you want to sell your timber on the market. Um, for higher prices, so you need to be uh, following um, SFI or Sustainable Forestry Initiative standards. We're going to provide the information that allows you to get that higher market price for your timber. Um, if you're a member of the Contractors Association of Montana, we provide that information at the start of a process, and then everybody is well informed from the get go, and they're not worried about lawsuits hitting down the road. Um, and the Contractors Association has actually come to uh, testify on our behalf uh, at the Montana legislature. So uh, that's that's how I would answer that question. Great, thanks. Um, let's see, there's another one. There was a couple of um, chats about um, swaps and story maps and um, heritage programs in general. I think that's a great idea, David. Um, We'll take that up with the tech team. I think it, I've always um, thought it would be nice to get an update on not just when programs started, but where they are um, and how they have flourished. It'd be great to have a, a dashboard. So we'll we'll get, I think that's something we'll try to get in the queue um, beyond just our network directory. Um, let's see, Kristen commented about their swap schedule. They work really um, pretty closely. Um, 
other programs don't as much. And that actually ties to one of the other um, comments about how programs, you know, how would you approach getting more support for local heritage programs? Um, from Allison's earlier slide, you can really see that there's there's a broad range of programs that are either well funded um, and very well supported within their state, and others that are that are struggling quite a bit more. Um, and you know, I think most of the people in the network try to avoid getting involved too much in political decisions, which can obviously be a big driving factor, but. Um, one of the things that was really highlighted in the Nature Serve strategic plan has to do with um, really informing decisions and collaborative um, decision making. And that means getting all of the important stakeholders to the table. So that means how do you talk to industry? Like it's important. We know that development and growth and things are happening. How do we approach that in the best possible way to avoid lawsuits? Um, keep as much biodiversity intact as possible. Like there is a way to thread the needle. Um, and the way to do that is through data and information that these heritage programs work so hard to maintain. Um, let's see. And George asked about iNaturalist and citizen science observations, which is great because we've just recently been having some more conversations about that. Um, there are a number of heritage programs that maintain iNaturalist projects, and I'll let Bryce talk about this because his program has really started taking that on. Um, but we've been having some recent internal conversations about how to do that more cohesively across the network. Um, we're still not sure exactly what that's going to look like, but yes, absolutely. Community science um, in all platforms, not just iNaturalist. eBird is a super important part of what we're doing, particularly when it comes to species that um, may not quite be on our radar or aren't getting the funding that are needed for dedicated surveys, um, but that may be declining and we don't even know about it. And so those are great resources to look at sort of wholesale and then start identifying trends so that you can get, um, get out in front of things before they're at the point where they're needing listing um, and more aggressive, expensive, conservation measures. Um, Bryce, you want to, or John? Sure. Want to yeah, I, I can say that to, to answer George's question, we are diving in completely headfirst with all of our, all of our weight behind it in terms of incorporating iNaturalist data. Um, there's around 280,000, I believe, uh, uh, submissions of iNaturalist records from Montana. We've been able to incorporate about 40,000 of those into our database. And uh, essentially we have a workflow where we have um, we download data from them monthly, um, and then we have an expert table. And uh, if an observation um, reported by naturalist matches up with an expert on our list for a particular taxa, we bring that data right into our database because we know it's a trusted individual. And our staff will spend time. I actually did this. I ate my ice cream this morning, which was I looked at my iNaturalist email and I reviewed about 25 I naturalist records um, for weeds and amphibians and reptiles that I'm familiar with. Um, and then the end of this month, we'll be bringing that data into our database. Um, so it, I just can't, uh, in terms of plugging in data holes across the state, I just see this as being a growing effort. Um, and then I wanna speak really quickly about a larger effort to put code in place to do this for the entire network. So we would have a, a network-wide expert table, that data would be downloaded to um, a data table where um, individual programs could download trusted data. Um, as Allison's slide said, much of what the value to our network in nature service, we curate data. Um, not all that data out, a lot of data out there is uh, of sketchy value, but we curate it and make sure we have high quality data in our network. Yeah, I would just add, it, we, we're using uh, iNaturalist and eBird and some of that as well. We're, we aren't quite as systematic in pulling it in, I don't think yet, but we, we are pulling a lot of that data in. I would just caution, as, as Bryce hinted at, that it's, it's not necessarily a panacea for species occurrences. There is, it does require a really rigorous review. Um, 
there are a lot of errors and poorly located occurrences and such that you know you need to be careful about. Um, but there's there's plenty of good data in there as well, as Bryce said. So it's definitely a resource worth using. Great, thanks. See, I don't, Karen, are there others? I think, I feel like we've hit on most everything that's come in at this point. Um, now, if there are any final questions, why don't we go ahead and get those into the Q&A or the um, chat, um, but we will start wrapping up the webinar and just want to thank our presenters in particular for taking the time today and sharing their expertise with us. Thank you all so much. And also thank you to all the attendees um, and for all that you do to support the protection of biodiversity wherever you are and however you're doing that. We really appreciate uh, all the things that you're doing. Um, if uh, if um, if you have any follow-up questions or thoughts that come to you after the webinar, we will be sending out the link to the recording to everyone that is here. And you can certainly send those in and we will email a response back to you. So uh, if you don't have anything right now, we can um, continue the conversation through email. Thank you, George, and th thank you everyone.